Welcome, welcome to this class on beliefs and doctrines of the Episcopal Church. I'm the Reverend Matt Seddon and I'm the Rector of Trinity Episcopal Church in Bloomington, Indiana. And the purpose of this class is to, well, obviously help you understand some of the beliefs and uh, doctrines of the Episcopal Church, but also to serve as part of our overall sequence of classes introducing newcomers or even people who've been around a while to the basics of the Episcopal Church, as well as cl these classes serving for uh, teaching for people who want to be confirmed or received. So, uh, but you know what, anybody's uh, welcome to take these classes and watch these courses. So maybe this will be useful uh, just in that regard. So the purpose of this class is to talk about what we believe, but I realized when I was setting it up that Episcopalians don't all hold the exact same beliefs. We're actually rather proud of that. Uh, and uh, so it's sort of hard to say here is what all Episcopalians believe or maybe believe in the same way. Uh, and probably it's more important for us to talk about how do Episcopalians typically go about deciding what they believe whether we do that as an entire uh, body, the church, or whether we do that as individuals, because every individual is allowed to uh, determine their own beliefs in the Episcopal Church. So really this is almost more of uh, a class about how we come to beliefs in our faith as Episcopalians. And what I'm gonna do is cover a few things that are definitely things that we believe they aren't necessarily things that set us apart from other uh, Christian churches. So that includes a lot of, of basics. Uh, and then also uh, some things that we believe that I would call uh, reflecting our Protestant heritage, uh, things that people commonly ask us about, especially if they come from uh, another church, uh, whether that's a non-denominational Christian church or the Roman Catholic church or something like that. I often wonder, how do you, what do you believe about the Blessed Virgin Mary or saints or things like that? Then I want to talk about how we construct what we believe, which includes uh, a discussion of how we go about interpreting the Bible, because the Bible is very important in constructing our faith and our doing theology uh, and making ethical decisions. Uh, also, then I will give you an example of how it is that our prayer probably more than anything else shapes our belief. And that's what Lex Orandi, Lex Credendi means, which is how, as we pray, so we believe. So that's the overview to the class. Let's start with the basics. <clears throat> we are Christians and we hold the Bible to be Holy Scripture. And it is central to us uh, in our faith. Uh, we believe that it is the word of God. Uh, we do not necessarily believe that God held the hand of the authors of each book or section of a book in the Bible and moved their hand across the page. Um, nonetheless, we do believe it is holy. It is where we start for a lot of our thinking. Uh, and uh, as this quote here shows, um, we decided back in, uh, in 1888 as a church that really um, the Holy Scriptures contain all things necessary to salvation. Now, what a lot of people say is that doesn't mean it contains the only things necessary to salvation, um, but definitely it expresses the importance of the Bible to us, uh, and especially when we say that it is the rule and ultimate standard of our faith. We, we really don't want to misuse the Bible, ignore the Bible when we're doing these sorts of things. I do have another class on how we read the Bible. Uh, it is not, we don't read it literally, typically. Most, most Episcopalians, maybe almost all, don't read it literally. Uh, we have particular ways that we read the Bible, but it, uh, nonetheless, uh, we take it very seriously, and we do consider it uh, holy, and we do consider it scripture, and we do consider it the Word of God. Um, even if it can be difficult to interpret. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, the next thing I would say our major basics for us is that we are creedal in the sense of following the earliest creeds of the Christian church. 
the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. Uh, we say the Nicene Creed on every Sunday and every feast day. Um, we say uh, the Apostles' Creed uh, in prayer, uh, for morning prayer and for evening prayer. And these are basically the creeds that set out the what I'm going to talk about next, which is the Trinitarian belief, our belief in a Trinitarian God. Um, but, you know, uh, what I would say is we don't require every single member to swallow every single statement of the Nicene Creed without critically thinking about it. Uh, people might view aspects of the creed, such as uh, the statement that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary in different ways. Um, but, uh, or maybe they think, well, that one's not as important to my beliefs as others, but nonetheless, uh, we are uh, following uh, in the line of Christians who have adopted the Nicene Creed as the basic statement of faith. Uh, and so, as I mentioned, the creeds uh, mostly talk about the God as Trinity. Do you believe in God the Father? Do you believe in God the Son? Do you believe God the Holy Spirit? So we are Trinitarian. We do believe that God is one being in three persons. Uh, we don't have a requirement for how you understand that. Uh, you can even be doubtful of it or be full of questions about it or wonder why we would even care about it. But in terms of identifying us as Christians, uh, we are definitely uh, Trinitarian Christians, as, as pretty much all Christians are. Not all, but most, almost all. And so uh, that, is, that is who we are. And uh, one thing I'd like to add is that we are also Chalcedonian Christians. So after the development of the Nicene Creed with its statement about the Holy Trinity, the, um, uh, the church still was arguing over the nature of Jesus and how Jesus could be uh, both fully divine and fully human. And they settled that argument, at least for a while, at the Council of Chalcedon in 451 AD, uh, with basically just a statement that says uh, Jesus was fully human and fully divine. The human part and the divine part uh, don't in intermingle, uh, but are not separated uh, in any uh, intrinsic way. Um, and uh, so basically Jesus is fully divine and fully human. Not all Christians are Chalcedonian. There are uh, a number who would say that um, the two the two separate natures of Christ are are not unified or connected in any way, but uh, we uh, just basically say Jesus is fully human and fully divine, and you can either figure out what you think that means or we can talk about it. It's a complicated question, uh, but anyway, we we are Trinitarian Christians who believe Jesus is fully divine and fully human at the same time. What other things do we believe in? Well, we are sacramental Christians. We believe there are such things as sacraments. Now, a sacrament is in the classic and a very good definition, uh, and I quote here, an outward and visible sign of an inward and invisible grace. Sacraments are basically things that, that assure us of God's presence, God's blessing, uh, because we are created beings and we need to see those things physically. And the sacraments are gifts from God and Jesus uh, that help us to know God's love and grace for us. And But here's, here's an interesting thing. Uh, you may have heard of uh, the seven sacraments if you're raised Roman Catholic or just heard about it in popular culture. One aspect of our Protestant heritage is that we would say officially the only sacraments are the ones that Jesus instituted, baptism and Eucharist or Holy Communion. Um, but uh, here's the funny. So we, we would say if you ask me to officially number the sacraments, there's two of them, baptism and Holy Eucharist. But the interesting thing is we also say that there are other sacramental rites, things that are uh, I guess I would put it as sacramental-like. And these are the other five things that are often called sacraments in the Roman Catholic Church. Marriage, confession, ordination, confirmation, unction, which means anointing a person either before death or, or shortly after death. Um, and uh, so we take those things seriously and we, we call them like almost a sacrament or just as important as a sacrament. But if 
forced to say, are they a sacrament or not? I would say officially they're not. Nonetheless, uh, that we do count them and we do practice them. Now, another thing that we have maintained uh, that not all Christian churches have, but this is crucial to our beliefs, is what we would call orders of ministries. Now, so these would include bishops, they would include priests, they would include deacons. Uh, so those are the ordained ministries. Another order of ministry, though, that we believe in is uh, lay ministers who are not ordained in any way. And basically, any person who's baptized can be a lay minister. Uh, we believe that's all it takes. So, um, so it's really four orders of ministries, but most people tend to focus on the fact that, we, yeah, we do maintain bishops, priests, and deacons. Uh, and and we, we do believe that ordination is conferred on you and confers a uh, change in your being uh, so that you are a bishop, a priest, or a deacon, whether you're functioning as one or not. Uh, other churches might say, well, you're a pastor when you're acting like a pastor. We would say you're a priest even if you're just sitting at home by yourself watching TV. Um, but uh, yes, we have maintained those, those ministries and they remain important to us as a way of ordering the church um, and conveying its teaching. Now, you might say immediately, hey, wait a minute, all that stuff doesn't look particularly unique. In fact, it all looks very Roman Catholic. Um, and in that regard, with the exception of talking about the sacraments, uh, that, that's pretty true. We do share a lot with our Roman Catholic sisters and brothers. And unlike a lot of other Protestants, we kept a lot of Protestant, uh, a lot of more ancient beliefs and practices that many other Protestant churches dropped. But uh, we do have a number of things that, that would distinguish us. Uh, and that is what I call our Protestant-ish stuff. Now you're watching this and taking a good look at that picture. I'm gonna tell you right now, the Protestant part of us does not include snake handling, so you're safe there. Um, what it does include is things like the Blessed Virgin Mary. Um, and people often ask, do you, do you have Mary in your church? Do you worship Mary? Uh, things like that. What I would say is that definitely we celebrate, we venerate Mary, the mother of Jesus. You really can't have Jesus without Mary. Uh, we have two feast days for her on our calendar, which is the most feast days for any single person other than Jesus on the calendar. Um, what I might, and this is actually a picture of the chapel um, of uh, St. Mary uh, at the Washington National Cathedral, which is a, um, which is an Episcopal cathedral. Uh, however, you might say we don't venerate her perhaps as intensively as many people do in the Roman Catholic Church, although there are some Episcopalians who do. You don't tend to see her as a central image uh, in the church. Uh, in this case, she is, but she's also paired right there with Jesus, and she's holding Jesus in her arms. So you're not going to tend to see in Episcopal churches images of Mary all by herself, although I'm sure there are Episcopal churches that have them, uh, just not as many. Uh, and uh, another key difference is we don't celebrate two feasts that the Roman Catholic Church has, which is the Immaculate Conception of Mary, meaning the idea that Mary was also conceived with, in a manner that didn't involve biological sex. Um, and uh, also we don't celebrate the Assumption of the Virgin Mary, uh, which is not, hmm, God exists. It's not that assumption. It's the idea that she was taken straight up into heaven without dying. Uh, those are two big feasts in the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, they're not in the Bible. And because we're Protestants, that is a key aspect uh, that we would say we don't celebrate those officially in the church. If you wanted to celebrate them at home alone, that's perfectly fine. Uh, we're just not going to do it officially in the church. Uh, so yes, she is very important. And like I said, you often see her in images holding Jesus to show clearly the link between Mary and Jesus. Do you have saints? Many people ask. And yes, we do. We have them. We can venerate them. Here's a couple of them. Uh, Thurgood Marshall, former Supreme Court Justice. Well, he was until he died. Uh, he was an Episcopalian. Isn't that awesome? So he is on our calendar of saints. Uh, now, here's the great thing about our saints is we elect them. They are not chosen by some mysterious hierarchy in the church. Uh, we get together uh, every three years as a, the entire church. And one thing that sometimes we do is we vote on having new saints. 
And the people who vote include lay elected uh, representatives of each diocese. So uh, the whole church, all people through their representatives um, selects the saints that we can venerate. So definitely, if you have a particular saint that you're fond of, um, we have in all likelihood, um, we don't share all the saints with the Roman Catholic Church. So we have fewer, um, but uh, we um, we have ways of venerating the ones that we do. We have uh, services we can dedicate to them with specific readings and specific prayers and things like that. So we definitely see saints as part of the whole community of the faithful and as examples of faith for us. Uh, the other thing that is probably more Protestant, though, is our church structure. Well, actually, this is a weird one because we are sort of midway between very hierarchical churches like the Roman Catholic Church or the Mormon Church, but we are not congregational where each individual church, uh, community or church is completely autonomous. So we uh, do have bishops, for example, and the bishops, uh, there's one main bishop per diocese. They have a lot of authority in that diocese. I, as a priest, have to obey my bishop. I mean, they can't tell me to do something illegal or contrary to our canons and such, but other than that, I have to obey them. They have a lot of authority, so we're hierarchical in that regard. We are linked to other um, diocese forming the Episcopal branch of what's called the Anglican Communion, which has churches in over 165 countries like Canada or Nigeria. And all of these are independent churches. No, no one of them can tell the other one what to do. Um, there is an Archbishop of Canterbury who is the head of the Church of England, um, but the Archbishop of Canterbury cannot tell any other church like the Church of Nigeria or the Episcopal Church what to do. So we're kind of midway between very hierarchical and completely congregational. Uh, and that's what this little uh, banner indicates. We can't tell uh, anyone, uh, any other province or any other church what to do. And we also have elected lay leadership at every level of the church from the parish all the way up to the highest levels. So lay people have a strong say in our church. Now, much more interesting, I think, in some ways, is to talk about how do Episcopalians decide what they believe? And, and this really might be pretty unique to us. It's, not, well, not completely unique. There are a few other churches who share this kind of approach, but uh, when I go through it, uh, you'll, you can see some things that are, are definitely distinctive about us. So what we often talk about is something called the three-legged stool. The sort of three things that are used to construct and hold up our beliefs. Uh, you will hear people say that this came from an Anglican theologian of the 16th century named Richard Hooker. He actually did talk about these three things, but he did not use the words three-legged stool. That was a later interpretation of his writings or a later sort of expansion of his writings. But at any rate, they are pretty similar. And so they go back really early. I mean, our church depending on how you define it, was born in the 1530s. Hooker was writing in the 1580s, 1590s. And so this has really been part of us for a long time. What we would say is the three-legged stools, the legs are scripture, tradition, and reason. And of these, probably one of the legs is mo the most important. It's scripture, like I was saying earlier. But we all acknowledge that scripture is very difficult to interpret. I mean, you can't just open the Bible, read a passage, and know exactly even what it's saying and how it might apply to now. So we bring in two other things when we're trying to construct our beliefs, uh, shape our ethics, define our theology, make decisions about what to do in worship, et cetera, et cetera. We bring in two other things, which are tradition and reason. Now, tradition is a kind of slightly vague category that sometimes we argue over, uh, but it includes what other theologians have said, the music and the, the words of the hymns we sing, what we do in worship, the prayers that we say, church or sacred poetry, art, uh, the, the resolutions that we pass at, at individual and national church levels that exemplify our beliefs, uh, many of our other practices. So uh, all of these things basically 
ways that the church has done things, even if they're not in scripture, that have been found to be meaningful and important to us, we also bring to bear in making decisions. And finally, we believe God gave each of us a brain and intended for us to use it. So uh, reason forms an, a really important part of how we make decisions about beliefs or about ethics. Um, and that reason can include what we've observed in the world around us. So we are allowed to believe in science and even integrate it into our theology and our religious belief system. Uh, that's not always easy to do. I work on it all the time. I think it's an interesting question. But uh, yes, so we use all three of these things and we combine them to make theological arguments. Um, so that does distinguish us from some other Protestants who might say that they only use the Bible. They don't, bringing in traditions or uh, and then they're very dubious about reason because we might be interpreting the Bible to suit our own selves in this moment in time. Uh, we would say, well, that is a danger anytime you bring your reason to bear on scripture, but we still think it's important and that God has given us a brain and, and called us to use it. So we use those three things. So, and at the same time, we also say that every single person can come to their own conclusions using these three things. So yeah, I get up in sermons and I'll, I'll say things about what I think you should uh, believe scripture is saying or what I believe scripture is saying or what I think is something we should adopt as an idea or an ethics. Um, but I'm not telling you, you have to. Um, in fact, uh, I deeply believe that my main role is to help you come to your own conclusion. Um, I happen to ha be fortunate enough to have had some real training in scripture, tradition, and reason. Uh, so I try to use that and bring that as an assist. But you get, to, you get to be your own theologian, be your own ethicist, interpret the Bible yourself. Um, we just recommend you do it in conversation with other faithful people uh, who are also thinking about scripture, tradition, and reason. So that's very important. Uh, our clergy do not dictate to you what you need to believe. Now, let me talk a little bit about what I was saying about lex orandi, lex credendi. Um, one of the things when you, probably the most basic thing that I could have said at the very beginning of this presentation was, do you want to know what we believe? Ask how we pray or come pray with us or see the prayers that we say, come to our worship service. We, uh, even though we have bishops and archbishops, they are not a figure like a pope who can simply tell every Episcopalian what they're supposed to believe. Um, so we don't have a hierarchy to tell us what to believe. We are not confessional in the sense of maybe other Protestants who have, say, the Augsburg con uh, Confession or other types of official statements of belief that you have to follow um, that, that are like concise or a ne nice, neat list. We don't have that. Uh, in fact, like I said, anybody can come up with their own belief system. What we would say, though, really shapes our believing is the words and things we do in prayer and worship. And that is captured in our Book of Common Prayer. Uh, and if you've noticed being Episcopalians being very attached and devoted to their Books of Common Prayer, that's why. It's that Book of Common Prayer, what we say in prayer, how we say it, that really shapes who we are. And we even use the Book of Common Prayer as a source for asking questions about what we believe and coming up with ideas about what we believe. So let me, let me give you an example. Uh, our prayer book it has a service for holy baptism. So when we baptize somebody, we follow this service. Um, and within this service, there's a portion of it called the baptismal covenant. Uh, so that's on pages 304 and 305 of your Book of Common Prayer if you wanna look it up. Now, the baptismal covenant starts with a, a really old set of questions. Do you believe in God the Father? Do you believe in God the Son? Do you believe in God the Holy Spirit? That's an ancient baptismal formula that goes back as far as we can tell, as far as we have documents about baptism, they seem to be using that, that statement of belief as part of baptism. But when they were revising our prayer book, starting in the 1960s and finishing in 1979, they ask the question, well, if you believe these things, so what? How does that shape your life? 
And they came up with five new statements, five questions that they ask you to vow. Uh, one, the first one is, will you um, continue in the apostles uh, worship and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in the prayers? And what that means is, will you keep going to church? Will you keep praying? Will you be part of a faithful community? Um, now there's uh, several other statements, but I wanna zoom in on the last one, statement number five which says, will you strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being? Now, here's the deal. Every baptism, everybody says this covenant, not just the person being baptized, if they're an adult or a, a, a young person who can speak for themselves uh, or the person's godparents, it's the entire congregation. Every time someone is baptized, we reaffirm our baptismal covenant by staying and making the promises all over again. So here's the thing. 1979, uh, most, I'd say the vast majority of the Episcopal Church did not uh, fully uh, act inclusively towards LGBTQ plus people. Uh, they might not have been excluded, uh, might have been welcome, but generally wouldn't, the church wouldn't ordain people who are openly gay, for example. Uh, and that, that was a pretty firmly held belief when this prayer book was put together. But guess what happens 25 years later? Uh, Bishop Gene Robinson, who was both openly gay and partnered uh, and a priest in New Hampshire. So we'd obviously already been uh, uh, ordaining openly gay people. Um, bishop uh, Gene Robinson was elected by the Diocese of New Hampshire to be their bishop 24 years after the Book of Common Prayer came out. Um, and I would strongly argue that when you say probably multiple times a year that we're, you're going to respect the dignity of every human being, it makes it very difficult to adopt a belief that some human beings, well, are less dignified, have less dignity, couldn't serve the church in certain roles or in any role. It just becomes impossible. And I'm convinced that yes, other things have brought about the changes that we now have in the church and how we've become a fully affirming and, and inclusive church. But a big one was our praying, was the way we said that over and over again, I think ultimately is what got the vast majority of the church to change. So that is just a, a single example of how when we pray, it shapes what we believe and who we are. And that is really fundamentally how Episcopalians arrive at their beliefs. So that's it for the presentation. Unfortunately, you cannot uh, ask me any questions. Uh, you can certainly make comments on this YouTube video, but um, I'll just tell you right now, I don't monitor those comments very closely. Better yet, send me an email. Revmat at trinitybloomington.org, R-E-V-M-A-T-T, -T, at trinitybloomington, one word, dot org, R-E-V-M-A-T-T, -T, at trinitybloomington.org. Send me an email. Be happy to answer any questions or, or just have a conversation with you. We could also make an appointment and just talk about these things if any of it was confusing. So I hope this helped you a little bit. I mean, I, it, in one way, it's kind of funny to talk about Episcopal beliefs because there's no easy way to go, okay, here's the things you need to believe if you're an Episcopalian. Um, but I hope you understand and have gotten a better idea that we really are a church that encourages people to come to their own beliefs, uh, and welcomes a wide range of beliefs within the Christian tradition, uh, and uh, just uh, really is a church that thinks hard about what we believe, and finally comes to our beliefs predominantly through our experience of prayer and worship of God. Thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed this and uh, certainly check out any of the other videos. Until then, bye.